everyone um, and welcome. My name is Karina Mullen. Um, on behalf of the International Committee, I would like to welcome you all and to thank you for taking time out of your evening, day or morning, depending on which time zone you are in, to join us today. Um, it's nice to see so many familiar faces as well as so many new faces. I'd like to uh, say um, a special thank you to our three wonderful speakers for joining us and for taking the time to share their insights with us today. I would also like to thank the PSC for sponsoring this event, as well as all the members of the International Committee's China Subcommittee uh, for all their amazing work in organizing this webinar. Before starting the event, we would like to take a minute of silence to mourn the horrific deaths and honor the lives of the eight individuals, almost all of whom were Asian women, killed in the racist and misogynist massacre at three Atlanta area massage parlors on March 16th. We are so busy these days and maybe haven't had a chance to do this, so let's take a moment to hold space for each other to grieve. Thank you. Um, with an increasingly uh, militarized US foreign policy towards China and rising levels of anti-Asian violence in the context of the pandemic and which directly impacts our CUNY community, our students, our workers, as well as the broader CUNY community, we already felt a sense of urgency around this event as we began organizing several months ago. However, the massacre in Atlanta on Tuesday evening of six Asian women workers hit home the importance of this discussion. As with all forms of racist violence, this example too has a much longer backstory that often gets erased in media coverage. This includes not only the daily drip of China bashing and fear mongering in the media in the context of the US's growing cold war on China, but also the braiding together of these media distortions with a long tradition of Orientalist discourse that has served to inform a violence that, oh, sorry, um, and it, to enable and justify the uh, multiple and intersecting forms of violence that impact Asian communities at home and abroad rooted in broader systems of exploitation and dispossession on which this country was founded settler colonialism, patriarchy, racial capitalism, and empire. Although it has unfortunately not always been seen this way within the labor movement, we believe racism, xenophobia, patriarchy, and war are labor issues. They are tied to structures that harm communities in which workers engaged in multiple forms of labor are embedded here and across the globe. We hope this evening's discussion will contribute in its own way to building radical solidarity and to strengthening our capacity to challenge the war at home and the war abroad and to understand how they are interconnected. With this aim in mind, IC member Jeanette Graulau will conclude the webinar with a discussion of the PSC's uh, International Committee's No Cold War with China resolution at the end of the event. I would also like to add here that this event is focused on the discursive and material dimensions of US aggression towards China. We will not be dealing directly with internal political, economic, and social dynamics within China, although this may be the topic of a future event that we organize as part of the work of our subcommittee. Now, uh, I would like to introduce my colleague and comrade and IC member, Jun Zhu, who will be introducing our speakers and moderating the discussion. Thank you, Karina. Um, thanks everyone for coming here today. Um, our first speaker, uh, Raksan Damba Ortiz, is a leading historian and writer who researches Western Hemisphere history and international human rights. She is the award-winning author of an Indigenous People's History of the United States, and she has a forthcoming book, Not a Nation of Immigrants. Raksan. Thank you. Thank you, Sun. And thanks to the International Committee for inviting me uh, to present at this important forum. 
I regret that I will not be able to stay for the whole program. This week, um, Viet Don Nguyen wrote, wrote regarding the Atlanta massacre of six Asian American women, individual perpetrators may be scary, but nothing is as scary as the systemic violence of a US foreign policy designed to kill Asians in large numbers, mocking them, threatening to kill them, setting up domestic context of marginalizing Asian Americans, setting them up as easy targets, beginning with low level racism and leading up to hate crimes and implying the, the targeting of whole communities. So degradation and demonization of China goes back deep into medieval Europe with a Marco Polo's 17 years of travel there in the 13th century, where he detected and wrote in his uh, very popular diaries, um, popular back home in the West, um, he detected a a communal and organized society that he viewed as having the potential of becoming a military power that could destroy and dominate Western Europe. European colonialism ideologically conceived of the Chinese as ancients who began civilization but stopped developing with European ascendants and were viewed as sick and decayed. Of course, this is an ideological tool of imperialism. As Edward Said argues, um, neither, imper neither imperialism nor colonialism is a simple act of accumulation and acquisition. Western European regimes joined by the US when it was founded were obsessed with China. The US founding fathers their push to conquer the North American continent was propelled by US imperialist desire to reach the Pacific and to do, dominate the Pacific Basin. They are still at it. The moniker Yellow Peril can be traced to the 1880s when German Kaiser Wilhelm II referred to Yellow Peril following a dream he had in which he saw a Buddha riding a dragon threatening to invade Europe. Ling Wing Fa writes that the concept blends Western anxieties about sex, racist fears of the alien other, and the belief that the West will become outnumbered and enslaved by the East. So Western European and United States imperialist actions came to dominate China by the 1850s, largely succeeding in transforming China from a wealthy trading partner into a chaotic backwater with the people suffering famine and poverty. The first immigration law made in the United States was the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act yet Ch Chinese workers were recruited illegally to build the railroads and work in agribusiness in California, but their status was contingent. The 1948 Chinese Communist Revolution success and throwing off Western dominance a century later recharged Yellow Peril with a best-selling book to explain the horrors of what would now be called Oriental despotism. In 1956, German-American self-appointed expert on China, Karl August Wittvogel, published a book titled Oriental Despotism, a Comparative Study of Total Power. The Chinese, according to Wittvogel, are all about total power and total terror. This is a wildly best-selling book in the United States. 
The racism against Chinese spilled over to include all Asians with the herding of US citizens of Japanese descent into concentration camps during World War II and the brutal three decades of US wars in Korea and Southeast Asia from 1948 to 1975, leaving millions dead. A Cold War with China persists today with US warships in the South China Sea and the US bribing and threatening other Asian states to join the US in containing China. What is less known than official and generalized exclusion and discrimination against Chinese is the corruption in the development of the US workers' movements based on Chinese exclusion. Zhang Kuwei Chen, a historian of the New York Chinese experience in the 19th century, identifies an omen in 1870 of anti-Chinese furor that would lead to the next decade's Chinese exclusion. It was also a harbinger of the developing white supremacy in the nascent trade union movement that already excluded black workers. A lengthy front page article in the main liberal newspaper in the country, the New York Tribune, written by the chief editor and future prominent labor organizer, John Swinton, addressed what he deemed unresolvable racial differences that led to a recent anti-Chinese protest. He wrote, the deepest dividing line between men is that of race, deeper than politics or religion, deeper than the contemporary differences of laws or manners are the depths and differences of race. The people of the United States or the white European race from which have sprung the Germanic, Celtic, and Latin varieties, all immediately related to each other by historical terms, all growing side by side for thousands of years and all developing a progressive civilization through the changes of time. Swinton argued that labor must unite with capital to fight the scourge of the Chinese against the threat of, quote, the infusion and transfusion of the Chinese Mongolian or yellow race with the white American race, unquote. He claimed that experts were in agreement that, quote, the Mongolian blood is a depraved and debased blood. The Mongol Mongolian type of humanity is an inferior type, inferior in organic structure, in vital force, or physical energy and in the constitutional conditions of development. On the West Coast during the same period, Irish immigrant Dennis Kearney enacted the vile anti-Chinese obsession of white workers. The majority of opposition to Chinese and Japanese immigration originated in labor unions and especially from Dennis Kearney's Working Man's Party on the West Coast. Their ravings warned of dire perceived threats to health and morality of the white population. White workers, white supremacy barred any thought of organizing the Asian workers. Across the country in the mid 1870s, there was high unemployment and economic depression. And so the Chinese were uh, scapegoated. Workers rallies in San Francisco led to the formation of the Working Men's Party of California in 1877, led by Kearney. Anti-Chinese immigration was at the top of the organization's agenda, with the party's slogan being, the Chinese must go. The following year, the party won 11 seats in the California Senate and 17 in the state assembly, playing a deciding role in rewriting the state constitution that denied Chinese citizens voting rights, which was later overturned as unconstitutional. But it had the desired effect five years later 
uh, with the Federal Chinese Exclusion Act. In February 1905, the San Francisco Chronicle stoked public fear, warning of a, quote, raging torrent of Japanese expected in California. The California legislature called for the U.S. Congress to limit Jap Japanese immigration. Delegates from 67 organizations in California, most of them labor unions, created the Asiatic Exclusion League, citing Japanese, quote, low standard of civilization, living, and wages, unquote. Branches proliferated, lobbying for exclusion and calling for boycotts. In 1906, the San Francisco Board of Education banned Japanese and Korean children, sending them to the, quote, Oriental School in Chinatown to join Chinese children who had been segregated there since 1885. The celebrity author Jack London was a leading and influential anti-Chinese bigot in the San Francisco Bay Area where he was born in 1876. London was not only a white working men's advocate, but also an active and radical Marxist and socialist, a member of the Socialist Party, which was very radical at that time before the Bolshevik Revolution and uh, had comrades, uh, was admired by comrades all over the world, including Lenin, by the way, and uh, Emma Goldman. In all London's speeches and political writing, even in his fiction, London railed against China and the Chinese. Like most of the elite and intellectuals of the progressive era, including those in highest political office, such as the President Theodore Roosevelt, he embraced eugenics. In 1910, London published a science fiction story titled The Unparalleled Invasion. Set in a future 1976, the U.S. government decides to take action to prevent China's potential world domination by unleashing biological war that results in the complete annihilation of the Chinese population. In a global history for German readers published in 1934, Nazi historian Albert Wirth hailed the founding of the United States calling it the most important sorry man. calling it the most important um, event in the history of the states of the second millennium was the founding of the United States of America. The struggle of the Aryans for world domination received thereby its strongest prop. Another Nazi era book in 1936, the translated title of which was The Supremacy of the White Race, characterized the US founding as the first fateful turning point in the worldwide rise of white supremacy, informing readers that the United States had assumed, quote, the leadership of the white peoples after World War I, without which a conscious unity of the white race would never have emerged. United States natural, national memory haunts the characterization of Asian Americans that has persisted beyond the loosening of immigration restrictions and situated by US wars in Asia. So the Asian Americans are seen as perpetual immigrants, as the foreigner within, not as actual citizens. Although European othering of Asians long preceded the virulent and specific US anti-Asian discrimination and exclusion that began in the late 19th century, its particular particularity an intensity may stem from the already existing deep-seated Indian hating with Indians as the enemy over a period of 250 years before Asian immigration to the United States began. Native American scholar Jody Bird suggests 
that the supposedly scientific insistence that all Native Americans had migrated from Asia through the Bering Straits evoked yellow peril immigration of potential enemies. Thanks so much. I welcome some questions. I think we have about 10 minutes. Great. Uh, thank you so much for that, Roxanne. That was such a powerful introduction and for grounding this event in such rich um, historical context um, and also uh, rooting it really within these um, intersecting histories of uh, exploitation and dispossession and domination. So I'm really thankful for that. Um, we don't have much time, as I said earlier, that uh, as Jun uh, mentioned and Roxanne as well, that uh, Roxanne will unfortunately have to be leaving us shortly. So um, we are going to take uh, questions uh, for Roxanne's uh, talk now before moving into the, um, to the other talks. Yes, I see, oops, I see we have a hand. Uh, Ganesh. I mean, thank you. Thank you for uh, the really uh, uh, insightful and powerful presentation on the uh, anti-China anti discourse uh, in relation with the Orientalist discourse. The one thing that I wanted to uh, just, uh, you know, kind of add as a qualification was that uh, um, in the period of the European Enlightenment, there were a lot of people like people like Leibniz and others who were very aware of the very advanced state of Chinese civilization. Um, and for a while, they also contributed to an anti-anti-Chinese uh, anti -anti uh, um, discourse, trying to um, mitigate the effects of the deeply racist discourses that you have outlined very cogently. Um, just that, I just wanted to I mean, point out that, that there were certain currents um, within the European <laughs> um, I mean, but you're totally on the mark in regard to everything. I mean, all the way until 1850s, China was the leading market economy in the world. Um, and the opium wars and the consequences of the opium wars, the disintegration of the Chinese uh, empire as a result of all of that um, raises several interesting questions as, as to how did China, despite all of that, um, manage to step up and uh, occupy the terrain of global political economy in the way in which it does now. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, you're right. There were, you know, there were some who, uh, I think everyone, that was their fear that China, they had an um, unequal trade because the Chinese invented everything, you know, from, from uh, gunpowder to, um, uh, you know, the silk industry. Um, and the, they had so much that Europeans wanted but the Europeans weren't making anything in particular that the Chinese needed or wanted. So it, they were, you know, there, were, there was absolutely this knowledge of wealth. Uh, so I think that was the thrust of imperialism is to dominate that and exploit that wealth. I'm most familiar with the um, US, um, uh, Thomas Hart Benton and uh, Jesse Fremont and, these um, uh, these these imperialists of the mid nineteenth century in the United States, who were obsessed about getting to the Pacific Ocean. And of course, it's meant you know genocidal wars against Native peoples to get there, and, and against Mexico, taking half of Mexico to get to the Pacific, for the sole purpose of dominating. And of course, once they did that, they jumped right over and occupied, uh, you know, the brutal uh, counterinsurgency, the uh, Philippines, and then Guam and the islands. And, and um, that, that was, it was always all about China and, and, and dominating the wealth. But in the process, you're right, they did everything they could to 
undermine China and its wealth and um, the, especially the deadly opium wars um, that was, and the opium addiction uh, that, that was unloosed. And imperialism has, uh, you know, Alfred McCoy has written a book on how imperialism uses drugs. It's a lesser known factor of imperialism, but it was very clear in the Vietnam War and the use of Laos and the Hmong and um, for heroin. Uh, so it's it, it that you know that destruction um, was tragic. But yes, a century uh, you know less than a century later to come back. I mean, uh, a century later to be uh, close to the greatest uh, trading power and in some ways benefactor to undeveloped countries. So I understand that they have uh, decided the new administration that Latin America is where they're going to begin to put a stop to China, which means more coups in Latin America. <laughs> so I, I think we have, um, since we have limited time, maybe what we'll do is group the next three questions and then um, Manny, if you want to um, also read out the questions from the chat, I'm, I'm not sure how we want to do that. So we'll, we will start with um, John. I think we have John has a hand raised and then Jun. Hi, I'm sorry. I'm calling you from a subway station. So I have to wear my mask. But uh, I just have one question because I agree with everything you've said today so far. Have you formed an academic organization to promote truthful historical perspectives on China, such as a China-America Friendship Association, which is active on university campuses across America, counteracting the China hate that's going on now. Because if you have such a group, I'll join it right away, even though I live in the former Yugoslavia. Well, I um, certainly such a group is needed. And uh, I'm hoping that um, my new book, which includes a, uh, about an 80-page 80, 80 chapter on uh, what I call the chapter Yellow Peril, going into great detail, um, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, that book and the context of it, U.S. Uh, immigration um, and imperialism, uh, does spur something like that. I myself am retired from academia. If I ever was in, I, I taught at a small state college my entire career that did not have graduate work. So a working class uh, college uh, in California, but I am retired. So not so much involved in academia as community activism. Now I live in San Francisco and um, 40% uh, of the population is uh, Chinese. I live in a Chinese neighborhood. All my neighbors are Chinese Americans, Chinese Americans. Some are um, uh, not yet citizens. And um, so I, there is, you know, in San Francisco, there's pretty strong um, uh, resistance, but there's also the greatest level of abuse of um, Asian Americans in the past year, right here in San Francisco. If I may say so, I think that one thing for uh, people who are connected to the academic world is once you retire, you're in the perfect position to graduate from being an academic to becoming an activist. Right. Well, I was always an activist before I became an academic. <laughs> I'm a 60s person. <laughs> uh, I'd like to call on Jun Ju to uh, ask the questions. He has all the questions. And if somebody doesn't uh, get their question asked, please uh, send it in the chat. OK. Um, thanks, Roxanne. This is such a great talk. I'm asking three questions from the audience. I'm the you know, uh, um, message person. Um, so the first question is, uh, in what ways does anti-Chinese racism reflect uh, or intersect with other forms of US racism? Um, the second question 
is what did Americans fear from China before its revolutions? And the last question I have is, please discuss your reference to Herman Melville's as a racist in your brilliant history of indigenous people. What, what was the last one? Yes, uh, so you had a reference to Herman Melville um, in your brilliant history of uh, indigenous people. Uh, and oh. uh, yes, the question is about, you please discuss your reference to that. Or he'll have to re they'll have to remind me what my reference was. <laughs> I haven't read my own book lately. <laughs> uh, you want who 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 asked that question? Can they tell me? Well, I got it from 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 chat. Maybe. Um, um, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I'll skip that one. But. <laughs> How how Chinese how anti um, Asian uh, discrimination and racism um, intersects with other racism. That's why I read you know the whole history of white supremacy in the United States. There is the that general. Um, it's built into the U.S. Constitution. Only uh, specifically, only white persons could be U.S. citizens in the U.S. Constitution when it was founded. Um, so white supremacy is built into, um, into the United States. It's a settler colonial state, white settlers displacing native people, and then of course, chattel slavery. Uh, so there, there is a, um, I know when we, I was involved in the um, establishment of um, uh, ethnic studies programs. I, I had a doctorate in history, but I decided to devote myself to that and help build one at this little uh, university where I taught. Um, and in, in developing curriculum in those initial days, um, we identified um, four, uh, four oppressed, what we call oppressed uh, groups. Uh, nationalities. Um, one, Native Americans, um, Chicano, Me Mexican Americans, and um, of course African uh, Americans, Black, and um, Asian Americans so from the very beginning, at least that, you know, in California where I was working. And that is now in our state, uh, the state legislature has just passed and they, they have stayed with that. So I think there's a regard on the part of, um, you know, progressive academics and um, and people, you know, that these are the you know fundamental uh, areas of uh, where colonialism and imperialism. We base it not just on race, but colonialism and, and imperialism has made of uh, different groups um, uh, targets and. Um, inferiorized. Now, Asian Americans, of course, have this added burden uh, that Richard Nixon so cleverly um, designed, uh, calling Asian Americans a model minority. Uh, and this was very specifically to oppose um, affirmative action and to hold up um, Asian Americans, you know, choosing a few number of successful, of course, any group has a few, you know, successful or rich people, um, and, and saying, look at this and uh, see how uh, it's their own fault, Black people or Native Americans or Chicanos, if they can't live up to, you know, what these people who've gone through, you know, he gave all these sad stories about about uh, Chinese exclusion and everything to bolster his, um, uh, and, and it really did take, you know, of course, uh, among um, Republicans, you know, his own party, but it did um, materially create resentment. Uh, I mean, it, you know, it's, um, it's part of an ideology that gets put out there and then becomes a truism. And um, so that, that's something that none of the other groups have, 
you know, a unique double whammy, you know, um, that I think it makes it very, very difficult because there is a lot of, you know, um, culturally, um, a, a, you know, a great respect for knowledge and, and you know, the old you know, Chinese, uh, uh, um, it goes very uh, far back of, uh, of, of education and, and, um, and knowledge. And, and so I, I think that, that there is a, um, you know, culturally there is, there is this, but it doesn't necessarily add up to being, uh, you know, wealthy or um, even, you know, um, prestigious or anything else um, because of the other factors. Uh, but that I think um, is a double, you know, is a burden that makes it difficult to see, um, a, you know, to see Chinese as, as uh, or any Asians as um, as oppressed. So, the second question is a fear. I spoke of that a bit. The fear was because China was uh, wealthy and productive and created so many different industries and had, you know, the Silk, the silk Road that, that um, provided, you know, um, many things, uh, I mean, almost everything in, in Europe. Um, they actually, the firework, the um, gunpowder was for fireworks, but of course the United, uh, the um, uh, Western European countries uh, immediately made it into uh, weaponry. Um, but this um, this jealousy, you know, there, there's resentment and jealousy and, and that desire to um, dominate and have access to that wealth and also suppress any um, competitor that it does not fit into the Western white supremacy. Um, because, you know, it's, uh, it is true that Europe, Western Europe is this tiny uh, peninsula of Asia. And um, that seems to be one of their serious um, long time uh, uh, problems of, you know, of, um, of seeking power and overseas imperialism, and then assuming that everyone else has the same kind of desire. Um, and I'll have to leave the Herman um, Melville because I cannot remember what I said about him and Native Americans. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Roxanne. Um, I know we're we're paying attention to time. We just want we know you have another event after this, so we want to really thank you for taking the time to be with us here tonight, and again for really framing and grounding our analysis uh, here of anti-Chinese racism and xenophobia in such um, incredible. Uh, detailed uh, history. So we want to thank you again for that and for your powerful presentation and um, take care. Thank you. And I will definitely listen to the recording. So I will hear everyone else speak and the discussion too. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, Bye. We have, uh, we're going to have the next two speakers uh, speak uh, back to back. And we have a general Q and A afterwards. Our next speaker is uh, Yang Hairong. She is a professor of social sciences at Hong Kong Polytechnic University, and has written extensively on food sovereignty and China-Africa links in recent years. And after um, uh, Professor Yan's talk, we have uh, Carl Jia, and he is an influential speaker and the host of the Silk and Steel podcast with a focus on everything China-related, history, culture, and politics. So, Carol. Okay. I'm going to share screen uh, because I'm going to use my uh, PPT to talk. Okay, can you now see my screen? Yes. Um, yes. Okay, great. Uh, I very much want to thank the organizers for 
uh, hosting for for having this event and for inviting me. Um, and uh, so the topic of my talk today is uh, the tale, tales of the debt trap, China, the US and the new yellow peril. And uh, so my talk to some extent also connects with Roxanne's when she talked about yellow peril. And this is based on research conducted by myself and also Barry Saltman uh, of Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And uh, I'm gonna use this, uh, um, this image coming from New York Times, and this article was published, uh, the opinion was published on March, uh, March 5th. Uh, why has there been a spike of anti-Asian hate? And uh, yesterday there is a, uh, this image was floating in uh, among my friend circles in WeChat and trying to provide the answers uh, because the original article mostly link anti-Asian hate to the Trump administration. Uh, why the answer actually um, coming from the Chinese perspective is a lot more than just that. So what you see here is New York Times articles. Um, you have also the Washington, Washington Post, Financial Times, The Economist, uh, Foreign Policy. So a lot of these are highly respected mainstream uh, media outlets. And over a period of decades, they have already been publishing a lot about China in the in the uh, in the uh, in the, the kind of discourse of anti uh, discourse of China threat. Okay. Um, so it's a lot of telling tall tales about what's happening uh, with uh, so-called China's global um, uh, presence. And uh, it's oftentimes assumed that in liberal society, uh, consensus is usually based on fact and uh, which is objectively determined. However, uh, that's oftentimes, there's also inaccuracy and sometimes involve uh, fabrications based on political purposes. And uh, um, currently uh, in the US, there's an elite consensus that China's Belt and Road Initiative, which is a Chinese uh, initiative form proposed around 2013 to build global infrastructure and to, to see that as a nefarious conspiracy. And uh, central to that kind of tall tale is um, the Chinese debt trap, which is something I'm gonna talk about today. So uh, around 2017, there's already US led mobilization against the Chinese BRI, um, Belt and Road Initiative that mainly involved building a discourse. And uh, that discourse coming emerging in 2017 also connects with the earlier discourse, which has been going on for a decade about Chinese neocolonialism and Chinese imperialism. And politicians in the US but from both parties were very much involved in contributing and making that kind of discourse. So you have someone from Trump administration talking about China. So China has been, quote, China has been criticized for loading poor countries up with debt, refusing to rene re renegotiate terms and then taking control of the infrastructure itself as it did with the Sri Lanka port of Hamantota in 2017. So the Sri Lankan port of Hamantota is my primary case today. Um, so this is little more than a form of modern day colonialism. So this kind of discourse has been going on for quite a while. And the uh, US also is trying to mobilize its allies, uh, for example, India, Japan, Australia, into this, uh, uh, into this same kind of discourse. And you have also, uh, yeah, I'm, um, I'm just gonna leave this very quickly. I'm not gonna read. Um, Pence, but it's, he's basically telling the same story that China is taking, um, that uh, the country is taking massive debt from China. In the end, they cannot repay it. Uh, they end up losing their property um, to China uh, through the debt trap. And you also have the Democrats uh, within uh, the, uh, the, in the US political circle to pretty much say the same thing. Um, and liberal media is also joining the same kind of discourse. The liberal media, typically they would be very critical of the Trump administration, calling him on um, making false statements. But on this issue, they are very much with him. 
Um, so again, talking about Sri Lanka, struggling with debt, this is the New York Times, and you also have BBC in both Chinese and English uh, langu language talking uh, in a very similar tone. So what, what we see emerging is a new yellow peril discourse uh, to talk about China is basically are uh, China or Chinese are guilty of everything. Um, so China is depicted as lawlessly bully in territorial disputes, a thief, and uh, because that's through cyber espionage, and then forced intellectual property transfer and a cheat through currency manipulation. And uh, China is also seen as okay, um, as seen as incapable of learning international norms of acceptable behavior. And there's a tendency to also assume the Chinese as a single coordinated actor from top to bottom, bottom to top. And uh, I'm quoting um, this uh, director of the US Federal um, Bureau of Investigation uh, in 2018. He said, one of the things we're trying to do is view China threat, not just as a whole of government threat, but a whole of society threat on their end. And I think it's going to take a whole society response from us. And these are the cartoons sort of portraying uh, the Chinese uh, BRI uh, is uh, really sort of threatening the lives, the existence of the poor, poor nations. And it's also echoed in Europe um, by European politicians like Macron, for example, also talks about the Chinese debt trap. And uh, the theme, one of the themes of the yellow peril is uh, Chinese predation through uh, addiction. So in late 19th and 20th century, uh, the discourse represented China and Chinese as using a variety of means to ensnare countries and peoples. And um, that's, that discourse is repeated again, of course, um, in the 21st century. And uh, what they uh, fear most about is the so-called Chinese uh, global dominance. And in that kind of predation, um, it's actually kind of mentioned also by Rexan earlier that from uh, the beginning of 20th century to 1960s, even union leaders um, also joined in this kind of campaign, repeated a claim that Chinese were addicting and seducing white women and children. Um, so this is an image of Chinese as being source of all evils. And uh, um, from 19th century, and the image of Chinese corrupt local authorities and addict the opium of the weak who must be protected. And uh, the yellow menons um, serving um, opium to uh, white patrons. Um, in fact, Britons and Americans were, in, uh, were key sources of opium addiction of millions of Chinese in China. In fact, because Britain waged two wars, opium wars, um, to, to force China, a uh, forced opium trade on China. So nowadays, uh, the Chinese debt trap is portrayed as addiction, as a new form of addiction. Um, Brahma Chilani was an Indian um, strategist and also propagandist. He was the first to claim in 2017 that there's a global Chinese debt trap. And uh, um, that was very quickly picked up by US politicians. Um, for example, an uh, official of the uh, former um, Obama administration talked about the Chinese debt is a myth of infrastructure finance, highly addictive, readily available, and with long-term negative effects that far outweigh any temporary high. Um, so this kind of, this line of uh, Chinese finance uh, is a form of addiction has been repeated um, by other politicians as well and saying that particularly, that particular affects Africa. And uh, the very scary case in point is Sri Lanka, according to them. So, um, so this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, okay, I'm going to try to speed up a little bit. Um, so here you have Sri Lanka being the center and you have China being represented on the left uh, in the figure of Fu Manchu, uh, which is the figure of the yellow peril. 
So in the, in the discourse about the Sri Lanka case, there are four elements, and I'm going to talk about, focus on one element, which is Chinese loans of Sri Lanka uh, debt trap. Um, just qu very quickly to show you a map, this is where India is, and that's where Sri Lanka. And uh, currently, Sri Lanka has a port in the capital city, uh, Colombo, but uh, the Hamantota, which is a town in the, on the southern end of Sri Lanka, is actually very close to the um, ocean highway, um, which is only... Um, you know, it's actually visible even if you are in the, that town, you can see the, you know, ships passing by on this uh, sea lane. So what they want to do is to build a port over there, benefiting from the international trade. Um, but that project has been called by its critics, especially by uh, US politicians, as a white elephant, which is expensive but useless. However, building Habantota port is a wholly Sri Lanka decision as Sri Lanka wanted to build it. And they also employed um, consultancy companies to study the feasibility, et cetera. And uh, um, it's intended to, yes, attract ships from the busiest ship shipping lane in the world. Um, the, the port was built with Chinese, um, uh, Chinese finance and also was built by Chinese company. Uh, it did not make profit in its first five years under the uh, Sri Lanka Port Authority management. Uh, but that's actually not, it's, it's not surprising because it's a new port and usually it takes time to build uh, a new port and to build a business for a new port. So it's still too early to call it a white, a white elephant. Um, currently the port now is on 99 lease um, to a Chinese company. Uh, it's, um, and that lease uh, is actually um, is a joint venture in, in a sense that lease is leased to a Chinese company uh, with 69.69% uh, uh, of the share and the Sri Lanka Port Authority has another 30% of the share. So it's a, it's a, they formed a joint venture and the lease was leased to this joint venture. And for that lease, a Chinese company paid 1.12 building uh, in 2017, and all the funds were coming from uh, the Chinese company, which is uh, Chinese merchant ports. The lease was a Sri Lanka idea. In fact, India was first asked to take the lease, but uh, India refused. And China was, in fact, initially very skeptical of, of this practice. And the Sh Sri Lanka uh, prime minister, um, actually went to China and tried to convince the Chinese government to take the lease. And then the Chinese company convinced the Chinese company to actually accept it. So that's, uh, that's how the, that's a kind of the story. The main purpose of the lease, however, is that actually not to pay Chinese loan, it's actually to raise money to pay expensive short-term loans from Western banks and sovereign bonds holders. And so, 98% of Sri Lanka's international foreign bonds holders are Western, mainly uh, from US entities. And most of their loans are actually um, at 55 to 6.8% of the interest. And um, so no, none of the money was used to pay Chinese loans, most of which, most of the Chinese loans are at 2% of the interest with much longer repayment periods than commercial loans. And here is the Chinese loans uh, to build Hamantota. And sort of we can see that 2007, when Sri Lanka was still at war, uh, Chinese was already financing the project. But at that time, the interest rate was 6.4 uh, due that, because that's the international rate for Sri Lanka at the time, because the country was in a war. And the term is 15 years. And, but later on, after the war stopped, uh, the, the loan from China to Sri Lanka all were kept at 2% two, uh, 2 uh, with 20 years uh, of the repayment period. Um, so Chinese Exim Bank loan, um, made loan to build Hamantota port and, uh, and that loan is already being steadily repaid. So there's no problem whatsoever for Sri Lanka to repay um, the Chinese loan. And uh, um, 
So this is the repayment schedule and everything is on track. So Sri Lanka had no reason to borrow money to, 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 uh, to lease the port, Hamantota port to China in order to raise money to pay Chinese loan. So um, the money actually, the, the, and also the Hamantota repayment um, is actually very small compared to what Sri Lanka must repay to non-Chinese lenders. And uh, the annual payment of the Hamantota loan is only about one-tenth of 1% 1 of Sri Lanka's external debt. So here is the, um, the, the information about the sources of foreign debt for Sri Lanka. And you can look at the years of 2008, 13, and 17. 17 is the year when they leased the port to China, to the Chinese uh, company. So you can see the part for China is about 2% 2, 2 around 2008, and then 2% still in 2013. Around 2017, China's, uh, uh, the debt to China is about 9% of the total foreign debt. And here's another uh, source of information uh, extending to uh, 2018. And the government of China, uh, the China Development Bank, loan is the, the dark blue, which is at the very bottom uh, of, the, of the chart you can see here. Okay, so the Chinese debt trap is wholly fanciful. 90% of Sri Lanka's external debt is non-Chinese and mainly Western, and mostly at much higher interest rate and shorter terms. So, and also, after 2027, Sri Lanka in, can in fact buy 20% more of the lease. That's making Sri Lanka the majority shareholder. And after that, Sri Lanka can still gradually buy back the rest of the lease. So that's like the kind of uh, deal that's made between Sri Lanka and uh, the Chinese company. And there's a, so this is to re in response to uh, the accusation that Hamantota port is a uh, that infringes on Sri Lanka sovereignty. Uh, the lease actually forbids foreign military base in Hamantota. So China, it's not possible for China to build a military base over there. And moreover, due to Indian pressure, most Chinese naval ships cannot even visit uh, Hamanto uh, Sri Lanka. Um, but navies of other states, Japan and US, are frequent visitors. Um, in fact, uh, calling on Hamantota or Sri Lanka. Um, so uh, from 2010 to 20, uh, 110 Indian warships and 80 Japanese warships and 40 Chinese warships visit Sri Lanka ports. Um, so Chinese uh, access to Sri Lanka is not necessarily more than other countries. Um, it's also claimed that 99 year lease indicates a loss of sovereignty and uh, um, the lease that the, the length of the lease itself is a problem, but in fact, that's the kind of uh, very conventional practice of the industry itself. As a case with Canadian authorities, in fact, allowed the town of Cape Breton, uh, uh, Nova Scotia, to be leased out uh, to to lease out the port of Sydney for 99 years. So this kind of practice um, is kind of standard practice of the industry itself. Uh, to conclude, um, well, just to also mention uh, Deborah Brodigan, who is also a China scholar who studies uh, mainly of uh, China-Africa links, uh, but also studied Chinese debt issue, uh, published an article about Chinese debt, debt trap is a myth recently. So we can show that there is no Chinese debt trap with Sri Lanka, which has been used as a, as a centerpiece of the discourse of so-called China debt trap. Uh, so there's no Chinese debt trap for Sri Lanka or for other countries like Zambia, where I have done a lot of research, or Djibouti, for example. And uh, however, that story has been repeated again and again by US politicians and media who are supposed to have done with their own investigation and reports, yet reports after reports, they keep repeating the same fanciful story. And this will, however, continue, unfortunately. And uh, um, and they will do so and to further the campaign against the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative and more broadly against what's perceived um, the Chinese strategic rival. 
So it is really up to us um, who, you know, who are against the new Cold War um, to actually refute all these fanciful stories. Okay, so that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Yan. Um, uh, now, uh, I think Carl. Um... Oh, hi. <laughs> I guess it's my turn. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Yan. And that was an excellent uh, detailed analysis of uh, the so-called Chinese dead trap situation and how it ties with the racism, ongoing racism in the United States. I would like to say that um, Americans have been killing Asians in and outside of the United States for over a century. This is not new. And this is all tied together with a, with a past history of imperialism and colonialism. Uh, U.S. interest in Asia from the very beginning has been tied with its obsession with China, with, with trade with China, as uh, Professor Roxanne has uh, pointed out. And from the very beginning, uh, the U.S. trade with China is tied with, uh, okay, can, can everybody see my, uh, let me share my screen. Uh, I don't think I'm sharing my screen. Let me share my screen so uh, I can, one participant can share, multiple can, uh, okay. So, am, am I sharing my screen right now? Can you guys see? No, not, not yet. yet. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Okay, so let me share my screen. Um, so what you're seeing right now on my screen, this is a picture of the 1985 Rock Spring Massacre in Wyoming. Um, and I, I, I'm, what I'm going to show is this is, this is actually tied uh, with the U.S. foreign policy. Uh, from the very beginning, the United States have, um, uh, have had this obsession to trade with China I mean, because China was the world's largest economy before the Opium War. And, uh, but but the much very soon the Americans realized, just as the British did, that the way to make money in the China trade is to sell drugs. Uh, in fact, most uh, who most of the New England elite, you know, who is who in the U.S. old money, they're all tied with the OP, OP, opium trade. Uh, British took about majority, about 10% of the opium trade uh, because the British mo monopolized the opium trade uh, by uh, shipping o Indian opium to, to, um, to China. U U.S. merchants in cahoots with, uh, with uh, uh, unscrupulous Chinese merchants, they source their opium from Turkey uh, and smuggle it into Canton. And that made some people very, very rich, including uh, the grandfather of FDR, you know, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, his middle name, Delano, is named after his grandfather, Warren Delano. And Warren Delano, as a very young man, at the ripe of age of 31, already made himself a millionaire from, from uh, smuggling opium into the Chinese port of Canton, or, or what's today Guangzhou. And in this pursuit of, of, uh, of China trade, well, the what the U.S. then follow up with, uh, with its uh, military intervention in East Asia. Uh, okay, so this, uh, my, somehow my, um, let me see if I can, okay. Now I can see what I'm sharing. Um, so as early as, as uh, 18, as early as 1867, U.S. Uh, carry out its expedition to the island of Taiwan against the indigenous people of Taiwan because at the time a, a U.S. Uh, a merchant ship a rover that was doing the China trade crashed on Taiwan and its crew uh, were massacred by the by the indigenous people of Taiwan. So as the so U.S. Marines went in as punishment uh, to to teach the indigenous people of tai Taiwan a lesson, so to speak. And, and then U.S. follow up that with its uh, uh, you know, Spanish-American war and its uh, conquest of the Philippines. 
and you know we have some of these cartoons from the from the 1899 you know this is the so supposedly the u.s bringing civilization to the philippines but um, and again you know the the the, the, the rhetoric of uh, you know, U.S. intervention against dictatorship was used, you know, against the Filipino independence leader, uh, Aquinado. And, and whereas, you know, the, we all know the real reason the U.S. was in the Philippines was using Philippines as a stepping stone to China. Uh, so China has been the ultimate goal, uh, you know, the, the El Dorado. Uh, for for the U.S. industrialist, and and in doing so, you know, U.S. have have uh, uh, have been involved in East Asia both militarily um, and uh, through commercial interests to exploit the the Asian labor. We have um, let me see if I have the the, the page. Uh, so you know, you, you most famously. You know, U.S. was involved in the in suppressing the Boxer Rebellion in China. This is a very iconic image of the U.S. Marines storming the storming the walls of Beijing and hoisting U.S. American flag on top. And we have uh, and and this is just just to give you a general history of the u.s interaction with 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 east asia but at the same time while u.s is sending army to brutalize people in east asia um a, a new narrative was developing at home it, it's a narrative of yellow peril right i mean psychologists could have a lot to say about that about the psychological projection about this fear of somehow the chinese yellow horde is coming over to to united states to take over um and that's why we get images like this you know the the yellow terror you know the the, the chinese Chinese immigrant uh, at the time mostly male as a threat to to white women and morality, uh, as a, as a, and, and then we have the massacres. Right, the eighteen seventy one we have one of the worst massacres of the Chinese people in L A. Where twenty Chinese were were lynched, and then we have the the. Uh, the, the picture I which I showed earlier, the, the massacre of the Chinese American coal miners in the Rock Spring, uh, Wyoming, uh, where 28 uh, Chinese miners have been massacred and 58 Chinese homes have been burned. So this is against this, this background. Um, I would argue the, 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 the kind of the twin uh, Chinese imperialism uh, abroad and the racism at home um, has re never really ended. I mean, we have uh, even uh, uh, supposedly anti-war movies like the Full Metal Jacket, you know, created this character of, of Asian women as a, a sex object, as, as, uh, as, a, as a character to be demeaned, right? I mean, this is even with the recent uh, massacre we have at the massage parlors, there's a lot of comments referring back to this infamous "Me love you long time, me love you a long time" from the movie, uh, from from Full Metal Jacket. Mind you, Full Metal Jacket is supposed to be an anti-war movie. Yet again, you know, Asians and particularly Asian women are merely reduced as subject, uh, as object, object of you know to be sexualized, to be abused, to be made fun of, and and th then that leads me to. Um, oh, there's another uh, nice image of the Boxer Rebellion. Um, that leads to our present, present day. You know, we have that uh, New York Times article that uh, uh, Professor Hyro has shared, asking the question, why, why is, um, uh, why has there been a spike of anti-Asian hate, right? Uh, Ian Goodrum on, on Twitter, he did a great uh, thread of all the, and, and all the articles in mainstream media that fanning the Sinophobia that leading to the present. There, there's actually a recent survey that came out that says uh, since 2020, now more than 45% of Americans believe China is the biggest threat to United States. I wonder where they get that, get their idea. You know, if they consume media like this, um, yeah, 
And, and then we have New York Times. Um, then we have U, U.S. government officials, uh, you know, during the COVID epidemic, pushing uh, and trying to shift, actively shift the blame on China for COVID to, to cover up, to distract for their own failures uh, to act within the United States. This is reported in the Daily Beast of all, all places. Uh, they didn't name names, but this was basically done by uh, a, a, a list of uh, um, Trump administration officials uh, like his uh, deputy national security advisor, Tom Pottinger, and then we, we know uh, Peter Navarro and, uh, and, and, and Mike Pompeo. And, and these are the people who have been actively stirring up the hate against China to distract from their own failures at home. Uh, and our media is complicit. You know, our media, like we often castigate China for its uh, government control media and, and then for propaganda. What um, people don't realize is that the access, access journalism that's practiced today in the U.S., that means uh, uh, most of the times the U.S. media is re regurgitating the official lines of the U.S. officials or the U.S. State Department. And we have, we have uh, articles like this, you know, even as recent as a few days ago, China approved its uh, fifth COVID-19 vaccine. It's made from ovary cells of hamsters. Right. And and we have uh, and, and I, I thankfully there's a, a Dr. Sandra has pointed out, you know, this actually it's over hamsters making over a hamster cell line to use to making um, uh, making vaccine. This was developed in the United States in 1957 is a common practice. Yet you, you have you, you know, the, the mainstream media is constantly doing dog whistle. Right, and, and, and then they ask the question, oh, why, why is there so much hate? Um, you know, then we have, uh, <laughs> we have the, uh, you know, American journalist, uh, Melissa Chan, uh, trying, in, in the light of this tragedy, um, trying, still trying to, trying to, I, I don't even understand what, what she's trying to say. She's trying to say this racism in the United States and, and violence against Asian is really bad because it gives, China propaganda material. I mean, these people have their priority all screwed up. Their, their, their priority is still geopolitical competition with China because, you know, preserving U.S. hegemony is really the, the number one priority for these people. And, and uh, there, there have been, uh, 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 you know, attempts in, in liberal media to paint um, to paint the recent uh, 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 anti-Asian uh, uh, violence as merely um, as merely something that that came out of the Trump administration, which is which is not true. You know, this is this is ongoing. This has been ongoing for a long, long time. And and we ha we even have. Um, let me see if I yes. You know, for example, you know, we have Nadi Hassan. He's he's castigating the the GOP congressman Chip Roy for making a remark about finding all the rope in Texas and, and tall oak tree, and, and in in, in, uh, in the talk about um, the, the 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 recent recent violence because Chip Chip Roy turned the whole whole talk about discussion about the anti-Asian uh, violence and the, the, the recent tragedy to, to a, a tirade against communist China. And, and Mehdi Hassan is at this, at this tweet looks like he's castigating the GOP for doing that. But look at what Ka Mehdi Hassan himself has said before. You know, if he, he actually asked uh, Dare Trump to call COVID a she virus. Right, I mean, all the the, the, the American political spectrum from, from from the liberals to the to the conservatives, they're all guilty. They they all have all been guilty of fanning the xenophobia, and that directly feeds back to the racism. I mean, I'm not saying you know some people make facetious remarks and, and say, oh, you know, people don't read New York Times and then go attack uh, attack Asians. Yeah, of course not. But what happened is all our media elite, our political elite, created this 
fear of permissiveness makes it okay to make fun of Asians, makes it okay to hate on Asians. And, and all this racist feels emboldened to act out the, the, you know, what, what they, they always want to do. And, and this, is, this is what's going on right now. And, and I mean, I'm like a little, getting a little upset just by talking about this. We, we uh, uh, this is this is where, this is this is where we are. I mean, I mean, this does not just affect Chinese Americans or, or Chinese national national nationals in United States because as we all know, people here, uh, you know, if anybody who look is Asian. <laughs> they are target. You know, we like the most recent uh, uh, victims of the anti uh, anti uh, Asian assault have been the Thai Americans, Burmese, Hmong Americans, uh, and, and most recently Korean Americans. And and these these people, they just because they look like they're East Asians, they became target of attack, and that is a reality. In United States, instead of what our what do our media do? It, it try to distract the issue. You talk about the, the attacker. You talk about um, you know his sex addiction. You know people with sex addiction don't go out and shoot people, kill people. You know a anything to distract from the from the from the idea that this might be uh, a racism related. So I'm very glad that uh, that you, you guys invited me and, and invited Professor uh, Hai, Hai Rong and, and, and Professor Roxanne to talk about this. I think it's it's really important um, to, to dispense with all this media bullshit. Um, hopefully I didn't take too long. This is I, I'm I'm done with my vent. <laughs> I'll, I'll 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 take a. You know, I stepped out from my soapbox and and, and and let people ask questions. Okay, thank you so much uh, to both Carl and and, uh, and Hairong. You both spoke, uh, you know, it's really helpful to all of us trying to understand the, the issue at stake right now. Um, we have a few questions that, uh, you know, union activists have prepared. Uh, um, and, um, you know, let's first go through the questions and if, uh, and this is for, both of you, and if you want to talk to each other regarding the questions, that is also uh, be great. Uh, so the first question that uh, people had was that how can, let's say, people on the left in the U.S., progressive people, discuss China without falling into the line of official, you know, American Cold War diplomacy? I mean, the question is, is there is so much, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, propaganda going on here in the United States. You have uh, people like Adrian Zenz that uh, suddenly, you know, re regarded as the ultimate authority on, on, on China issues and quoted everywhere. So how do people here in this country actually have a genuine discussion about China? That's my first question. Yes. I, I, may, I, may I go first? Yes. Um, I, I think for, particularly for the people on, on the left, uh, you know, uh, Mao Zedong has said no, no investigation, no rights to speak. But um, you know, I understand people are busy with their lives. They, they may not have time to go spend hours to debunk, uh, uh, you know, propaganda that's being pushed out by Adrian Zenz and and you know, all the CIA cut out like RFA. I mean, it's it's really overwhelming. But what we have to realize is as a left in United States or, or left-leaning people, we have more capacity to effect change within United States, right? Uh, you know, regardless what China does within its own borders, uh, you know, the, the Chinese actions today mostly affects the Chinese citizens. So regardless of what the Chinese government do as People in the West, as people living in United States, uh, Canada, North America, or, or Europe, people here can effect more. Can, can you do you have more effect on the Chinese government versus the say American government? Uh, I mean, okay, that's that's actually debatable. Uh, but 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 right now we have so many issues at home, right? We actually have children locked up in cages on the borders. Um, we have we have uh, people go hungry. We have people affected by the COVID crisis. That that they're you know the, the fourteen hundred dollar uh, stimulus check is just 
it's just a, a drop in the bucket. Uh, and, and, and we have all these issues to, to take care of. Let's, let's focus on issue at home. Right, and, and these are actually issues we can we can actively do something about. And and as for you know the 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 the, the, the Cold War propaganda is just being pushed by various national security establishment. Um, like if you if you really if that's an issue that speaks to you, you feel passionate about. I I my suggestion is do your own research. No no no, like read as much as you can on the subject uh, before uh, passing judgment, because, because we have to realize we are being bombarded by propaganda 24 seven, right? I mean, I mean, in places like, like China or former, former Soviet Union, people understand, you know, the, the, there's a state media, they understand state media will co always cover from the position of the government. In the United States, we don't have, there's, it's not transparent, but in, in actual effect, um, you know, <laughs> our media is, uh, is, have been embedded with the government, with the military industrial complex. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's not by the government, by decree, but, but by, uh, by things like the, the you know, the, the structure of corporate media and the whole access journalism, right? Because, because you know, to, to, to get the access uh, to the government official, you have to be friendly with them. You just take the, the, their leaked stories and present as, as a real story on, on the news. But, but then you, you can kind of become the, 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 the spokesman for the U.S. government without, you know, even realizing that. Oh, I mean, I'm, so, I'm sure some journalists actually realize that and don't care. But we as consumers of news, we need to realize that. So uh, that's my, my take. Thank you, Paul. Um, Hiro? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Um, from what I can see, um, perhaps given the case I reported about Hamantota, a lot of the mainstream media have been very much engaged in a similar kinds of politics as you know, a lot of politicians. So uh, I would encourage people to go to alternative sources. Uh, a lot of actually citizen reports coming from uh, Americans, Europeans who live in China, work in China, and they experience China in, in, in a way, in an everyday you know, context. Um, in the fight against coronavirus, I've seen a lot of these reports on you. Uh, it's like a, a video blogs on YouTube, um, and these are actually very, very interesting uh, reports, which give on the ground view of actually what's happening in China. So I think going to um, there are also a lot of uh, uh, doc. Uh, Doc, uh, there's a Japanese docu documentary maker who produced a really wonderful uh, documentary about uh, the Wuhan, um, what's happening in Wuhan. Uh, so he actually went there for interviews, etc. So I think a lot of these kinds of sources can be mobilized and can we can actively, uh, you know, share them with with other people. Uh, I, I would think this is one one of the ways to to um, combat and to stay away from. Um, the Cold War uh, discourse about China. I, I also yes. want to um, add, uh, you know, it, for the for the left on the United States, you should not be controversial to be against imperialism. You know, to to be against interventionist wars. That that should be not be into. You know, and you, we need to also realize. The, the U.S. imperialism also affect us back home because it, it takes away resources. Um, you know, it, it's, first of all, it's morally wrong to bomb children and weddings and funerals in in, in certain world countries in, in in global south. But but also for it actually it does have impact back home. You know, it takes away resources from building domestic infrastructure, from giving American health care. We cannot have health care because you know we need more money to build, you know, give, build 355 uh, worship for the U.S. Navy. I mean, that, that's bogus. The it, current United States military industrial complex only benefit a very special selected uh, small group of people, you know, the arms manufacturers or lobbyists, you know, all the think tanks that they founded. 
all the politicians are bribed. <laughs> These are the people who continue to benefit from the system. Like the, the people within the United States and people on the left in particular need to realize now is the time to take back our country. It's, it's, it's time to, to, to put our foot down and say this, this cannot go on. You cannot continue to, to make up excuse to continue this racket, this grift. To, 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 prof, to make profit for yourself at expense of miseries for, for countless millions of people all over the world, including the United States. Great. Thank you all. Uh, I'm done. Thank you all so much. I mean, I have one more question, uh, very brief. Uh, so given all the reasons that why we should not get into a, you know, a conflict or cold war with China, then why do you, in your mind, why does some, uh, you know, you know, liberals or, you know, uh, some even self-claimed leftists in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, seek, you know, they join the conservatives in demonizing China. I mean, they are okay with sanctions or any kind of um, um, actions. Um, and who actually benefit from that? Um, so that's the question. Mm -hmm. Well, I think well we... Go ahead first. Uh, okay, so, I mean, you know, we... There, there, there's, I know there's camps on the left that says uh, neither Washington nor Beijing, right? Say like, like oh, they're, they're equally bad. So we're just going to set this out. But what, when, when you two both sides this issue, you are standing with a stronger side. You are, you are, you are not being neither Washington nor Beijing. You are standing with Washington right now. Right now, it's not China that's trying to escalate the tensions against the United States. It's the United States that is escalating tensions and the Cold War against China. So, it, it, you know, it, it, to not even recognize that, it's, I think it's been, uh, <laughs> it's been false. I mean, I'm pretty sure a lot of people are just being misled by the propaganda, but the, there's, uh, there's uh, yeah, there are people who are actually benefiting, you know, who are these people? They're the think tanks. You know, founded by the by the by the by the arms manufacturers, there are these NGOs founded by National Endowment for Democracy, right? With the, the, yeah, there, there are people, there are people uh, making money, there are people people um, uh, uh, deriving benefit from this grid, and then the, you know, and of course, all the lobbyists, you know, for the for the arms manufacturers, we have we have uh, institutions like the ASPE, the Australian Strategic uh, uh, Institute. And they, they supposedly uh, uh, ostensibly Australian government think tanks, but over 50% of their budget is funded by um, a combination of United States State Department and Reefy Young uh, uh, and Lockheed Martin and all these arms manufacturers. And, and they are the, one of the Australian media has reported, they are the main source of a lot of the Sinophobia uh, Articles that was been producing Australia, Australian media, and guess what happened? You know, Australia government just recently purchased anti-ship missiles from the United States, uh, and ASPE uh, collect a finder's fee. You know, and and so so we have this think tank that hype up the China threat. It gets the Australian uh, government to buy weapons from from Rifia, from Lockheed Martin, and then sell pocket, uh, pocket a middleman fee. And what does Australia need an uh, anti-ship missile anyway? Their largest tra trading partner is China. You know, they need to protect their trading route with China from the Chinese. I mean, like these these things, it's, it's like comedy. It's it's so ridiculous. We we don't need only the audience anymore. You know, all the mainstream news is just just satire by themselves. I'm um, sorry, I'm venting again. I'll, I'll step off my soap. <laughs> Thank you. Hiro? Yeah, um, I think as to what the question of why, why does the US is willing in engaging in this new Cold War? I think we can look at it globally and also domestically uh, for the US. Uh, globally, I think uh, China is one of the countries um, and it's a large country that does not follow the U.S. prescription for development, and yet was able to manage to have development. So that in itself is seen as, just by itself, is seen as a challenge for the U.S. domination of the global discourse of, of, of development. Uh, as, uh, so, that, so that's uh, for, ch for China. And uh, um, in terms, that also has impact on, on de other developing countries. So when I do research in Africa, 
And I do hear people sometimes talk about, okay, you don't have to necessarily listen to Washington consensus to follow neoliberalism to actually have development, look at China. So China is seen as this example that it's possible to strike your own path of development without necessarily following every uh, step of the prescription given by the Washington consensus. And uh, with China going out, engaging other developing countries, uh, China oftentimes is seen as the alternative source, um, not necessarily an alternative to, uh, to everything, um, but China's approach to development is somewhat different. Um, I wouldn't say alternative as totally different, um, but somewhat different from the standard conventional Washington consensus. For example, China does not force uh, privatization, um, does not make privatization as a condition for loans, for, for, for um, investment, et cetera. China also does not uh, uh, you know, ask for the uh, dimin diminishing role of the state um, in development. So China does not ask for any of the, this. Um, while of, uh, providing loans to developing countries. So that in itself is also seen, uh, perceived as a challenge to the uh, neoliberal approach to development. So that I think globally, that's how seen, uh, globally perhaps that's how the US elites have seen China as, uh, as, uh, as a challenger as if. Um, I think domestically uh, for the US, this is a classical tactic of shifting scapegoating China for uh, many of the problems that's occurring in the, in the US itself. And in the case of how of the coronavirus, this probably as Charles uh, has, Carl has just mentioned, you know, this is already um, that, um, th that kind of scapegoating um, is very, very corrosive yet, you know, to some extent it's shoring up the building up the consensus among the elites. Okay, great. Thank you both um, all so much for all the answers. Um, I, I want to say that uh, you know I'm a you know I'm very proud of my union, the professional you know, uh, uh, staff congress at the CUNY, that is uh, you know actively pursuing a anti-war position, um, uh, 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 you know regarding China. And this event is made possible by the support of the union. Um, and we actually have the president uh, Barbara Bowen and the vice president Andrea. Uh, Vespis in the audience as well. So, you know, uh, it's, it's not every, you know, <laughs> labor activists or unions are on the wrong, wrong side, I would say. And um, so um, we're going to open up the, the have many questions of the audience. Uh, uh, we are running out of time. So we, I'm going to call two, um, um, you know, uh, uh, people to raise a question together. And and um, you know we, we use the rest of the time uh, for the speakers to respond. Um, I'm gonna call Musa Bika um, and Linda Nu. Um, uh, you know, Ms. Musa Bika, you can raise your question first, and Linda second, and the speakers can respond to the two questions together. Um, hi, thank you so much for um, hosting this event, and thank you, Dr. Melvin, for inviting me. Um, I just want to bring back the conversation to. Uh, the discussion on like the what's going on with the Uyghurs in China and I just want to preface this by saying I obviously don't have a very clear picture of what's actually going on um, and I completely agree with Carl that as people living in the U.S. we need to focus on uh, bringing this empire down and you know not concern ourselves with other nation states um, and I don't mean to flatten the dynamics between the U.S. and China at all but I am concerned to see this not insignificant trend among the left where like, instead of just advocating for a hands-off approach, people are actively accepting and like even regurgitating war on terror, um, Islamophobic rhetoric when it comes from another country. And to me, as a Muslim, I feel it puts those of us who oppose any sort of US intervention or imperialism, but like we are Muslim and we're trying to um, push back against maybe our own circles who are pushing for harmful re legislation who are asking to involve the CIA and FBI, and we know how harmful that stuff is. Um, but when on the other side, you know, suppose that anti-imperialists are just adopting this war on terror rhetoric, it just makes it really difficult, I think, to uh, be able to advocate, you know, 
or to be able to bring um, people who are genuinely concerned over to this position. So um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, isn't there a way to advocate for hands-off approaches and um, reigning in our own government or abolishing it instead of regurgitating these war on terror um, points? All right, thank you. Um, uh, Linda? So I'm Joe and I'm here with Linda. And we are uh, part of Shelter and Solidarity, a group which uh, actually promoted this event. So thanks to Tony O'Brien, John Lawrence, and others who reached out to us. Um, we're also from UMass Boston. We also promoted this to our faculty staff union list. So anyway, just trying to build a little urban university solidarity up the East Coast, just uh, just a shout out to the organizers and, and the panelists. So I'm Joe. My question is uh, Joe Ramsey. And my question, I've, I've posted a few, but I think the one I'd like to, to ask is in the chat box right now. Um, and that is uh, the current issue of monthly review, that's the March 2021 issue, has a very interesting note from the editor regarding the impressive, relative to Western powers anyway, decarbonization plans that have recently come out of China. They appear far in advance of European, let alone US, uh, plans for curtailing fossil fuel emissions in the next you know, uh, decades and, and by the end of the century, especially. My, my, um, my question is, what could progressive left academics and organizers do now uh, to connect the climate crisis and China's breakthroughs uh, and to help build real international alliances or solidarity uh, that's both anti-imperialist anti and kind of ecologically necessary? I mean, I'm literally wondering like what kind of, I mean, it was mentioned earlier, friendship kind of organizations are going on that actually bring people to China and back and so forth, touring their ecological operations. I just wondered to what degree does the, um, do, you know, basically, uh, do we see concrete uh, solidarity efforts, uh, you know, that are existent or what possibilities specifically around the environmental crisis? Because I think if there's anything that's obviously global, right, that that certainly is. And, and if we can kind of address two problems, feed two birds with one hand, as my friend says, uh, on the ecological and anti-imperialist front, I'm curious what concrete ideas what might come out of you know this conversation? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have you know each of you have two minutes. Uh, thank you. I, I will take the second question. I will answer the easier one. Um, I think uh, it's it, this 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 one actually. Uh, I think it, 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 there's actually something we could do. Is uh, you know we could highlight the advancement that China has made in um, handling, in confronting the global climate change by switching to green, greener resources, which China has done on a massive scale. Um, it, it, as you mentioned that, that these, there have been very little media coverage of that. Well, you know, our job, we could bring, highlight these, these China's achievement into shaming our own government into doing something about it. Because right, especially in this, today's environment, that when there's a, when there's a panic among the, the, the Western elite about how we're falling behind China, how China is eating our lunch, we, we can you actually leverage that, that dynamic, leverage that fear, lever, leverage that anxiety and say, look, you know, China has gone far more ahead, you know, in this, in this regard. How can we, you know, compete? <laughs> you know, like this is actually a positive uh, a competition, right? So like, like we can uh, bring, bring more, more highlight into the achievement China have achieved in, in uh, bringing greener energy, reduce carbon emissions, and shame our government into action. I mean, that, that's something I think we can, we can, uh, we can do. And uh, yeah. Um, Hiro, please. Yeah. Um I think uh, it would be very interesting to and important to build uh, this kind of people to people connections, uh, organization to organization kinds of connections. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of in, in, the, uh, in terms of environmental protection, ecological diversity, uh, there are a lot of organizations in the US which are doing really wonderful things. So why not come into China and, uh, you know, introduce your experiences, as well as, you know, building up connections with similar kinds of organizations and interests in China. I think these kinds of things will be, um, this kind of mutual understanding, mutual learning would be very important and should be part of that anti-Cold War 
uh, kinds of effort and discourse that we are currently seeing. Um, so in a way, I think um, hands-off approach definitely is important, but kind of US going out, uh, US organizations going out, reaching out also um, to, to, to Chinese, um, to Chinese society is also very, very important. Um, part of that story should also be about exposing uh, the good things, good experience in the US. For example, uh, there are city councils about uh, food, uh, you know, localizing food supplies. Those are very good uh, environmentally, you know, helpful, ecologically beneficial, etc. So these kind of practices are very, very good. Uh, and should be spread. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of these kind of agro business, how it had uh, you know, undermined uh, US uh, ecological diversity, uh, the problems uh, created in the US should also be learned by other countries as well. And not enough has been uh, perhaps been, been, been learned because I'm afraid that some of the models for example, U.S. food or uh, agriculture models still being promoted as the more advanced uh, kinds of template for new green revolution, et cetera. So I think there's so much that can be done here. Thank you all so much, uh, the speakers, the audience. We have um, um, our uh, activist and our professor, Jeanette Grandal, uh, that would uh, speak to all of us about the union uh, uh, actions. Um. Thank you to all the panelists, including our improvised guest from Australia. This has been a, a, a truly in-depth uh, analysis of the evolution of the militarized imperialist ideology of the yellow peril and the dangers that lie ahead if we don't do anything about it. Now, I just want to say first that we gathered here tonight not just as, as scholars and educators, as students, as friends and colleagues, but also as members of older and newer generations of anti-imperialist labor organizers. And we did so keenly aware that there is one urgent cause that brings all of, all of us together today. And that is to fight against this uh, undeclared war against China to fight against the dynamic and living legacy of what our panelists have called the yellow peril. This undeclared war against China, and our panelists said it brilliantly, is truly launched by both Republicans and Democrat administrations alike. And uh, it does have sinister ramifications. Now, I think we can all agree, uh, all of us newer and older members of generations of educators and labor activists, we can all agree that we find ourselves at a unique time and, and place, a unique moment in history. For the first reason is that we, newer generation of educators, we have the, the luxury and kind of the comfort zone of looking back at this history of the evolution and the tough sediments of the yellow peril. And we can kind of, uh, of, of combat and attack it intellectually and politically with, with people who have not necessarily directly endured the, the damage of yellow peril. But we also have the responsibility that comes with the enjoyment of that historical reading and a responsibility that comes with the enjoyment of that comfort zone. And that is the responsibility of engaging in horizontal dialogue with people like our panelists tonight and with horizontal dialogue, not only with Chinese and Asian communities, but with communities worldwide, communities from the global South who are enduring the Rawan versions of the Cold War. Now, we also have the advantage, and I want to say this because we are educators, we are professors, and we at the International Committee, we do have different generations of activists. We also have the advantage of learning from colleagues, mentors, educators, friends, labor activists, 
who endured the legacies of half a century of Cold War in the 20th century. They are the older ones in the union, but these are the folks that truly speak of the struggles against an old and a new Cold War. These are the folks that truly can speak of the scars that never go away. And these are the ones that can truly say much about the open wounds that continue to shape the world we live today. I think we can all agree that listening to this excellent, after listening to these excellent presentations, it is, it is not possible not to link the dynamic evolving yellow peril ideology to the thousands and thousands of peoples enduring the impacts of unending civil wars, civil wars around the world fed by Western imperialist powers. We cannot avoid but to make explicit connections and linkages between the yellow peril and the cold war against China and make the connection with the millions in Latin America and Africa and the global South displaced from their own lands, victims of their own analogous peril or yellow peril, millions for whom migration, ironically to the West under the most perilous conditions seems to be the only option. And finally, I believe we can all, uh, we have the responsibility of making direct connections between the dynamic and sinister yellow peril, the dynamic evolution of this sinister phenomenon and the thousands in the US good fellow Americans who have experienced political and labor harassment, families torn apart by the rhetoric of being a good patriot or being a good American, uh, friendships ruined, and the working class mothers, wives, daughters, and sisters who to this day continue to say farewell to their husbands, children, brothers, friends, while the war hungry elite sends them to fight wars that have nothing to do with them. Uh, I want to say that we do have that, that extraordinary responsibility ad ahead of us to make these connections explicit, to, to build the linkages between the tangible outcomes of an old Cold War, the tangible outcomes of an old version of the yellow peril and what an undeclared war against China launched by the US can bring to our friends, our communities and our nations. If there is something our guests tonight have made us aware of is that the US Cold War against China is damaging on many levels. And it's damaging on many levels, not, not only because it, it is as, and I think Carl, Hyron, and even Roxanne made this point earlier, it's damaging because uh, large factions of society seem to be deciding to remain silent. I want to reiterate that silence is not an option. I say this as an educator, as a labor organizer, as an activist, but especially, I believe that, uh, that to, uh, the students that are he here with us tonight, they need to know, and I'm sure they understand, that silence is a luxury reserved to those living in a world of equality, fraternity, and solidarity. This, at the moment, is not the world we live in. And until we get there, silence is not an option. Someone, I think Carl made excellent remarks about uh, what activists and, and the seemingly uh, liberal left groups here in the US can do. Well, I think what Carl mentioned is, is worth emphasizing. And again, it's probably one of the loudest messages that, that, that comes from the presentations. That is that silence only allows 
our war hungry elite to mortgage our own futures. Our silence, and especially I say this to the students who join us tonight, your silence is a blank check that you are giving to a war hungry elite. You are, it's a license for the war hungry elite to gamble with your life. Now, a deeper thread that I believe uh, came from the presentations and the, and the excellent questions that the audience raised, uh, and probably a more, a, more, a more dangerous phenomenon at stake here, is that behind the complacency, behind the silence, behind the tacit consent of large segments of society to the new Cold War with China. Behind it, there is a Western imperialist ideology of self-righteousness. We have to call it by its proper name. To our students, again, Western self-righteousness is the belief, the wrong belief, the distorted belief that the West and the Western world can set the global standards for democracy, emancipation, and civilization. If something was clear here tonight, Hyron did an excellent presentation of how China is revolutionizing international relations and development aid. Roxanne did an excellent presentation of a historical survey of the yellow peril and the civilizational debt we in the Americas have with China and Asia. If something comes out of these presentations is that the time is now to fight and to remain systematically and consistently vigilant against the Western imperialist ideology of self-righteousness. Now we mm -hmm. at the International Committee of the PSC, we are fully committed to move away from Western self-righteousness. And in fact, I'm going to say this, I know some of our comrades are still with us. Uh, we do have that mandate. The union gave us this mandate because we are the international committee. And we have taken this mandate very seriously. Because we firmly believe that as educators, the university is the place to build emancipatory dialogues with China, Asia, the global south, and the rest of the world. Because we believe that the nobility of humanity is real, that we all have the right to a dignified life, that it is real, but it flourishes in a world beyond imperialist wars. Because we are convinced by the living legacies of the old Cold War, by the living legacies of the Yellow Peril, including the new versions of this sinister imperialist ideology. We are convinced that imperialist wars, imperialist ideologies are a failed strategy. And because we have learned the hard way that hot and cold wars leave wounds that never heal and permanent scars in peoples, societies, and even landscapes, we, the International Committee, approved the resolution, no cold war with China. We, you, the, the entire audience and the entire uh, community will have a chance to uh, follow this conversation. But we want to say here that our, our resolution opposes and rejects the steady buildup to war with China by both Democratic and Republican politicians. We declare that as an anti-war US labor union, it is our duty to join in solidarity with our Chinese fellow workers, educators, and scholars to oppose US government racism and military aggression towards China. This is the resolution we put forward as a platform 
for a horizontal emancipatory dialogue within our own union with friends, comrades, and colleagues with other unions, with activists worldwide towards achieving the goal of eliminating the yellow peril and no cold war with China. I want to take this opportunity to thank our panelists. It's, uh, it's, it, you, have, you have blown my mind. I think it's, it's, it's it, what you have done is, uh, is an extraordinary, you have forced us to be fully immersed in the history of the yellow peril from different angles. And uh, I can confidently say on behalf of the international community, the international committee, although they have not asked me to say this, but I'm going to say it anyhow, that certainly you'll be invited back at the international committee. I believe your compelling messages tonight assure us that we, the international committee, are we are in the right path by approving the resolution No Cold War with China. To our marvelous audience tonight, students, colleagues, friends, mentors. We have people not only from CUNY, but we have people from uh, George Washington. We have people from a university in Jamaica. We have friends from the Global South. To all of you, I want to say thank you for your questions and your vigorous discussion tonight. We're just the frosting in the cake, as we would say. It's truly the safest indicator that uh, our union is, is in the right path with our resolution of no cold war with China. Finally, I want to say that uh, we want this forum to be our union, our labor union invitation to all here tonight moving forward. So that as scholars, educators, activists, all the new, we can together build a world beyond empires and war. Thank you. This is so great. Uh, uh, thank you, Jeanette. Uh, Jeanette's uh, address concludes our today's event. And thank you all so much for, for joining us today. We will have more events in the future and uh, we welcome you back uh, in the future. So have a good night or have a good day. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye.